I'll talk about some of the I'll talk Sorry. about some of the modifiable factors um, with respect to long-term TBI care, most centrally um, empirically supported rehabilitation interventions that can be deployed across the continuum of care. I am very grateful to have a lot of um, federal support from the NIH and Nidler and PCORI and the Centers for Disease Control. Um, all of these grants are what support the work that I'm going to share. I have a, a TBI audience, so I'm going to skip through this. Everyone knows full continuum of, of um, sequelae that can have to happen after a brain injury. Most, but not all, mild TBIs do recover completely within a few days or weeks. Um, I'm going to talk about um, the, the late effects of TBI. So in other words, the long-term sequelae of a remote TBI, which we know can differ enormously across individuals. Um, so much happens between discharge from the hospital and what our patients would call a good recovery. So that's a meaningful and a fulfilling life. So we'll talk today about functional and life trajectories that can unfold after a brain injury. And we'll kind of think together about where there are opportunities to improve them for everyone. One of the big questions is, does the trajectory of aging after brain injury differ from those of uninjured peers? Some of the work, I, some of the research I'm going to share in the beginning here comes from the TBI model systems of care. So let me just talk about that for a moment. Um, this is a nationwide clinical care and research infrastructure to study long-term outcomes after brain injury. So here at Mount Sinai and all of the Mount Sinai hospitals are a part of our model system of care. We are one of 16 centers in the United States. We enroll patients at the time of inpatient rehabilitation, and then we follow them longitudinally at one year, two years, five years every five years thereafter, um, up to a total of almost 30 years in some of the centers. This is the where the, the model system centers are located. Blue is currently funded. This is, it's safe to say, this is the largest prospective study of TBI outcomes in the world. We enrolled our 18,000th person um, this cycle. This, um, we've done quite a bit of, um, of fancy statistical work to determine that our um, patient population in, enrolled in the model systems is in fact representative of um, the national sample, the national population actually of people who receive inpatient care for a primary diagnosis of brain injury. So we use data from the prospective payment system, the um, uniform data system for medical rehabilitation and the e-rehab data and we essentially determined that our sample is largely representative with a few small exceptions. And based on those exceptions, we have used um, a variety of upweighting statistical approaches to create a weighted data set that is fully representative of the national population. In collaboration with the CDC, our research group used um, the nationally weighted TBI model systems database to characterize just a snapshot of the functional status of people who are still alive at five years post-injury. As you can see here, um, the outcomes at five years are still pretty grim. Um, we see a lot of disability, dissatisfaction with, with life, unemployment. 29% um, are using illicit drugs or alcohol. Um, and one in five patients who had been enrolled in this study at inpatient rehabilitation, which means they survived the acute injury, went to inpatient rehabilitation, one in five had died by five years post-injury. We've done quite a bit of work on this topic. Um, depending on the study, people who survive a moderate to severe TBI have a shortened lifespan compared to their uninjured peers of about seven to nine years. And we're very interested to understand what it is that people die of. The numbers here come from death certificates, which we know notoriously omit a lot of information about factors preceding or precipitating uh, what we would consider a premature mortality. But you can see these, the, the numbers here reflect odds of death relative to the general population. You see that seizure is one of the highest causes um, across studies. We broke things down by age groups just to see a little bit more nuance here. And what you see here are standardized mortality ratios based on the general population. One thing we notice is that younger and middle-aged adults 
are dying disproportionately of things like external causes and poisoning. Um, poisoning often implies an accidental or intentional drug overdose. Um, and again, seizure is present as a pretty high standardized mortality ratio across the lifespan. Older adults are preferentially dying of things like falls, aspiration, pneumonia, sepsis, and nervous system disorders. Our group has done quite a bit of work um, applying advanced statistical and psychometric methods to analyze the very rich longitudinal data that we have in the model system. Here we used individual growth curve analysis to model um, the GOSI. Everyone's probably familiar. It's the most common outcome measure. Um, it's a very gross functional measure, so it's not a great measure, but it's very commonly used, the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended. Here we just looked at survivors versus non-survivors. And we wanted to see, does the functional trajectory differ? Like, could we tell earlier on who is on sort of a path to premature mortality? The way that these models work is that you introduce a whole bunch of covariates like age and education and injury severity indices, functional indices, and the shapes of the curve will change depending on the, the demographics um, that you're interested in. But what you see here, this is from a 20 year old individual who survived the injury and those who die simply never got better. So that alone, these very gross surveillance measures that are amenable to system-wide surveillance and don't really require um, detailed medical follow-up um, from a data collection standpoint are a clear indicator of this person is at risk. It's also important to look at more specific acute care indicators um, of mortality risk. This study reports essentially the things in, in blue were measured at three weeks, the things in uh, pink are measured at three months. So having a trach and having active seizures still at three weeks were associated with poor one-year outcome um, and low weight and still having a PEG tube in place at three months were associated with poor one-year outcomes. No huge surprises there. Our group has done quite a bit of work trying to understand chronic disease burden following TBI. So again, we mainly concern ourselves with what happens after a person leaves the hospital. Um, this study shows um, substantial evidence of greater disease burden across multiple body systems in those with a traumatic brain injury compared to um, a control population. Um, I'll just point out some of the largest differences are in things like infectious diseases, substance use disorders, um, headaches, sleeping problems, and stroke. Risk for stroke goes up quite substantially after a brain injury. This is some work by one of my um, awesome postdoctoral fellows, Raj Kumar. He looked at um, the epidemiology of comorbid conditions. He used ICD-9 codes that were collected at the time of inpatient rehabilitation. So they're really reflective of both pre-injury pre conditions and things that kind of were diagnosed or that occurred during hospitalization. So our goal was to understand disease burden of our patients when they were under our care. Um, we coded those ICD-9 codes into 45 comorbidity categories, and then we applied a dimension reduction approach. It's called tr treelet transform. It's a, um, it, a classified cluster analysis, and it groups the comorbidities that tend to co-occur. And we see three clusters that really emerged. The first is um, acute medical diseases or infections, complications, the second are chronic conditions, and the third are substance abuse disorders. So again, underscoring the relevance of pre-injury health, post-acute, post-injury complications, which we always knew, but substance use disorders continues to emerge as a really serious um, risk factor and, and component of chronic health after brain injury. We also used um, some of those uh, longitudinal data modeling methods to look at rehospitalization as sort of an indicator of chronic health. Here we analyzed longitudinal rehospitalization as a dichotomous outcome. So were you rehospitalized over time, yes or no? We combined um, generalized linear mixed models and individual growth curve modeling to essentially model probabilities of rehospitalization over time, that time de dependent probability of event data. Um, what you see here is that on average, Risk for rehospitalization is high in the beginning. We have a lot of patients coming back even for planned procedures, planned follow-ups, and then it goes down and then it starts to go back up again. 
And again, the shape of that trajectory will change when you enter in individual level demographics and injury characteristics. We have all these instructional tools on um, a website. So if you're ever interested in playing around with what a patient of the demographics you're working with wants to look at based on data in this data set, um, you can do that. This is hot off of the press. We just, in the last couple of years, revamped the way that we code reasons for rehospitalization. We used to have this very gross level, level of categories that was like medical, neurological, other, and so it wasn't highly informative. We've now added a much more detailed coding system so that we can see why are people being rehospitalized years after injury. So you see that epilepsy remains one of the most common reasons for rehospitalization even 10 years after injury. It was interesting to see too that heart disease was so common. Um, we know that those with TBI, again, are at elevated risk for stroke. Um, and we see that clearly here. Um, the rates of rehospitalization for things um, that are suggestive of new injuries start to increase after two to five years. These are the things like um, trauma-related joint disorders and injuries due to external causes, um, intracranial injury. These, these are quite clearly new intracranial injuries if they're happening five, 10 years post-injury. Um, and this is indicative and reflective of something that we have seen throughout our research. Individuals with a traumatic brain injury are at elevated risk for re-injury. In one of our studies using a population-based data set, we actually found that 20% of the population risk for a traumatic brain injury in late life in older adulthood is attributable to a prior traumatic brain injury. So this research begins to beg the question of, it, should we be conceptualizing traumatic brain injury as a chronic disease process as opposed to an event? I mean, a broken arm, that's an event. It happens, it heals, you move on. We're beginning to see more evidence that at least for some people, not all, a moderate severe brain injury tends to, can evolve into something looking more like a, a disease process. According to the, the World Health Organization, there's a very clear definition of a chronic disease process. It's permanent, non-reversible, um, requires special training for rehabilitation, and may require a long period of observation supervision of care. So when we look at the research that is available to us, we see that, long, that TBI is associated with a lot of chronic health conditions clearly requires extensive rehabilitation and surveillance care at minimum. Um, and the reason that we talk about this in this fashion, it's not to frighten our patients, certainly. And again, not everyone has this um, trajectory of outcome, but until traumatic brain injury is designated by CMS as a chronic disease, it will continue to be difficult to ensure that long-term survivors are able to get the care that they need across the care continuum. So there is kind of like a, a policy push and an advocacy role for research in this area. Now, we can talk about the long-term outcomes of TBI without talking about dementia and CTE. Some, some of you um, asked specifically to hear about some of our work in this area. Okay, this has been all over the headlines, so I think everyone has heard about it. For decades, we have been taught that TBI is the strongest environmental risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So in broad strokes, the progression of this story is that several um, case studies in the late 70s, even the 60s, were presented um, as isolated case studies. They were people with severe TBI who developed clinical Alzheimer's symptoms, and then many epidemiological studies um, and cohort studies showed associations of traumatic brain injury with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then more recently, um, studies from using brain tissue from people who died acutely, mostly out of the Glasgow brain, brain bank, they showed, they sh supported this association because they found beta amyloid plaques that were similar to what used to be called senile plaques in Alzheimer's disease. And they were seeing these in young acute decedents with traumatic brain injury. So we've got some case studies, we've got some epi studies, and we've got a mechanism. And so this story really proliferated, I think, for decades. Um, but the reality is that there have not been a whole lot of cases of individuals who are diagnosed with classic Alzheimer's disease during life, and then were found to have the hallmark neuropathological features of Alzheimer's postmortem. Our group has um, 
has updated the literature. This is actually not the most recent update. So the Institute of Medicine in 2008 did a comprehensive systematic review and con concluded that traumatic brain injury, moderate to severe brain injury, is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. We reviewed the literature from 2010 on, that was when the IOM review ended, and we are currently now reviewing it again. It is not published yet, but the story stays the same. Some studies say, yes, there's an association between TBI and dementia. Some are conditional, and by that I mean that when you enter additional covariates into the model, the relationship of TBI with dementia is attenuated or becomes non-significant. And then a growing number of studies are saying, no, there is no evidence of a relationship. You'll notice that for those studies that say yes, in most cases, the type of dementia is not Alzheimer's disease. So this is actually a fascinating story because there is something happening, but we don't, we don't think it's Alzheimer's disease. I'll talk for just a second about some of the studies I was most closely involved in. This is out of a population-based study in Western Washington. We looked really hard to find an association between TBI and Alzheimer's. This was right before the, right after the IOM report came out. So I was certain we were gonna to contribute to the literature with another positive finding. No, doesn't matter age of onset, doesn't matter time since injury, doesn't matter severity of injury, APOE, allele carrier status, nothing. So we approached colleagues at the Rush University Medical Center in Chicago who lead um, two additional studies with autopsy endpoints that are very similar in their design to that previous study, the Adult Changes in Thought study. We harmonized all of those data to do a much more comprehensive evaluation with neuropath endpoints. And here's what we found. No association between traumatic brain injury and Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic changes, beta amyloid plaques, neurofibrillary tangles. We did find, which was somewhat novel, an, an association with cortical microinfarcts, which is not surprising. And with Lewy bodies, Lewy bodies are the protein implicated in Parkinson's disease, among other things. Um, and we found those proliferated in the frontal and temporal cortex. We were curious to know whether this association could be reflective of prodromal dementia. So we censored all of the analyses, only including those who were injured before the age of 25. So we are certain here, we are talking about a remote exposure and its late life implications you'll see that all of the findings were replicated. So we most recently, one of the limitations to be fair of that previous study, so we used a really gross indicator of traumatic brain injury. It was a self-reported question and it was something very vague, like have you ever had an injury so severe that you lost consciousness? So our colleagues at all of those studies have now implemented the brain injury screening questionnaire, which is a measure that we developed and we've used across dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds at this point of sites to screen for traumatic brain injury, it uses a very systematic cueing system to remind people of contexts in which they may have hit their head. If they hit their head, subsequent questions query duration of unconsciousness and duration of altered mental status, which allows us to characterize injury severity. Using those more detailed TBI ascertainment data, we still find no associations with Alzheimer's type neuropathology, but we do see atrophy. These are, that's an indicator of diffuse axonal injury, which is a hallmark characteristic of traumatic brain injury. Um, let me just talk for a second about what I mean when I say post-traumatic neurodegeneration. We have reason to question the notion that traumatic brain injury results in Alzheimer's disease. So we're operating now under the assumption that it results in not nothing, because we see a st substantial subgroup of our patients who do undergo what is clearly a neurodegenerative decline. Um, those epi studies, though, that looked at associations of TBI and dementia and relied on um, medical coding data may have overlooked the fact that when we talk about post-traumatic neurodegeneration, it needs to be de defined relative to a previously achieved post-injury level of function. So we're talking about someone sustaining a traumatic brain injury, recovering to whatever level of recovery they're able to achieve, and then declining. If we simply consider the post-injury chronic consequences to be dementia, then of course we're gonna find an association with dementia, but the chronic and stable effects of a traumatic brain injury, that is not a degenerative disease. Those are the stable effects of a pathoanatomical injury to the brain. So when we talk about declining after an injury, this is what we're talking about. Now, 
there are a few studies that have used an approximation of this type of a definition. So here we see a study. This again uses the Model Systems National Database actually. And so this is the proportion of the sample across age groups that declined from a previously achieved post-injury level of function. The, the proportions here are quite alarming, I agree. Um, but one thing that, that really stands out to me is that the proportions of individuals who decline, it, it's not just the older adults. So we're not just talking about age-related change. 39% of 16 to 19 year olds decline from a previously, like this is, this is a, a process other than usual aging. Um, so we've done some work trying to understand better what is the clinical phenotype of post-traumatic neurodegeneration. This is a study where we use data from the NAC um, database, the UDS, where all the Alzheimer's disease research centers put their data into. Um, we're fascinated by this question. How is, Al how is TBI? different from Alzheimer's disease in the long term. And we find that there, the, those with a TBI have more neurobehavioral symptoms, more neuropsychiatric symptoms. We replicated those findings in a larger study where we simply compared people with dementia who do and do not have a traumatic brain injury. So all of these people in this sample were diagnosed with dementia of any subtype. We found that those with a traumatic brain injury actually perform slightly better cognitively but they have far more um, medical conditions. And I didn't show it here, but again, we replicated the finding of neurobehavioral change, neuropsychiatric symptoms, and predominant motor changes, tremor, gait instability, and falls. So we're beginning to understand the clinical features that may distinguish post-traumatic neurodegeneration from Alzheimer's and other dementia phenotypes. This is actually a study where um, colleagues looked at older adults, veterans in a, residing in a nursing facility, and those with a lifetime history of traumatic brain injury had worse function on processing speed and executive functioning. Now, again, this is characteristic of traumatic brain injury, but the thing that I would point out is that they are not worse in areas like learning memory and language, which is what you would expect them to be worse in if this were an Alzheimer's type change. So I'll talk just for a moment about some of our post-mortem work. Um, our team has had a large MIH grant that compelled us to participate in the development of the consensus criteria for, for CTE neuropathology. So a major question right now in the field surrounds the question of um, how prevalent is CTE in community samples? So. The first consensus uh, was published in 2016. We've begun to apply that now to several of our brain donor programs. And our early findings were showing us that it's, un it's not very common. Only 11 out of 200 cases in this case did we see diagnostic CTE. They were mostly men. Um, most, but not all, had a history of head trauma. It's important to keep in mind that almost all of the research on CTE that has been done so far has been conducted in highly selected samples, individuals with very, very high exposure to repetitive subconcussive and concussive head trauma, and people who self-select into a brain bank for CTE, which almost always means that they have very concerning neurobehavioral symptoms during life. We have now, and we did find some associations between CTE neuropathology and things like UPDRS um, motor scale, for example. We just published this, the results of the second consensus meeting. So essentially what happened in those intervening years is that we refined the diagnosis, the diagnostic criteria for CTE to make it more specific. What that means is that when we go back to our autopsy samples, the prevalence of CTE in community-based autopsy samples is tiny. Here we found CTE neuropathologic change in only three of 562 cases. Um, so this is not a common pathology in the community, and its association with traumatic brain injury is really still unclear. I'll just point out, too, that um, the types of CTE change that we see are nowhere near as dramatic as what have been published in those high exposure, high symptomatology um, samples. All of this work on post-traumatic neurodegeneration that I talked about so far it all looks at traumatic brain injury through the lens of other neurodegenerative diseases. 
Is it Alzheimer's? Is it Lewy body dementia? Is it Parkinson's disease? And we really strongly believe that this entity deserves um, characterization in its own right. So in 2013, we launched the Late Effects of Traumatic Brain Injury Project. We were just refunded in 2019 to continue longitudinally following our cohort. What this is, is a living brain donor program. So we enroll people during life. We conduct extensive neurobehavioral evaluation, motor evaluation, um, structural and functional MRI. And then post-mortem, we collect the brains. Everyone in the study agrees to brain donation. We conduct um, high-resolution post-mortem neuroimaging, which allows us to visualize lesions that would be undetectable on gross anatomy and maybe missed in standard neuropath um, blocking protocols so that we can do image-guided tissue sectioning to actually characterize the lesions of interest. We've also successfully co-registered the ex vivo imaging with the in vivo imaging. This allows us to do a look back and see was that lesion present during life and can we correlate that lesion pattern during life with clinical phenotypes characterized by neurobehavioral change? We imagine that there will be several domains of change. Snapshot of the let be sample. And this is just, I wanna point this out because we often think of injury uh, exposures in silos. There is sports concussion, there's repetitive head trauma, and then there's single moderate severe TBI. What you see here is that most of the people who have sustained a moderate to severe TBI have also sustained repetitive head injury, defined as military service, combat, contact sport exposure, intimate partner violence. So these are not isolated groups. Injury exposure patterns are vast and varied. We've just begun now to begin using the neurobehavioral data we've collected during life. And this is in an effort to start to understand the various clinical phenotypes that can express after a brain injury. Here we used a two-step dimension reduction approach. I won't go into the details, but we see three clusters that kind of hang together. The first is defined by neurocognitive impairment. The second is defined by, oh, I'm not going in the right order. We have mood and neurobehavioral impairment, cognitive impairment, and then cluster three are those people who are doing well. These are the people who are probably having those stable and sometimes slowly improving trajectories for years after injury. So the question then becomes, is post-traumatic neurodegeneration the same thing as CTE? The answer to that question starts with the question really of what is the clinical manifestation of CTE neuropathology? So just last month, this has been a very busy time in this um, area of, of research, we published provisional research diagnostic criteria for TES, traumatic encephalopathy syndrome, which is conceptualized as sort of a clinical correlate of CTE. I will be the first to say, and hopefully not the last to say that these diagnostic criteria are not ready for clinical use, nowhere near it. We're beginning now to apply these criteria to our Let B study data set. And I will tell you that the effects, the, the clinical phenotype of single moderate to severe TBI is almost indistinguishable in many cases from what is being called TES, which is supposedly associated with repetitive head trauma. So this was actually an area of contention during the consensus development process. So everyone on this authorship list agrees that there is a lot more research that we need to do to understand this. Um, just to point out with this slide that how heterogeneous long-term outcomes can be. If you look at the last, the bottom boxes on these slides, those are people who are improving over time. That part of the narrative is often overlooked because the other stuff is just like more scary and more exciting. But a substantial proportion of our patients who survive long-term moderate severe brain injury do well and continue to improve. Our colleagues um, who study prolonged disorders of consciousness also report that many achieve functional independence by five years post-injury. So this all makes us think a lot about what are the things that make it so that some people have these terrible outcomes. Of course, pathologic change is a huge player there, but what is it that it's allowing people to continue to improve many years after brain injury? And this is where we start to think about the continuum of care. We know that some pieces of this continuum are not, are not optional. Emergency room, trauma center, ICU care, in most settings, everyone who needs it get, gets that care. After hospital, the care disparities become enormous. So 
where does a person go and what do they receive during ICU care? Well, as many of you know, here at Mount Sinai, Dr. Escalon has been working with many of you to employ early mobilization efforts in the ICU. So essentially starting rehab in the ICU. We have seen that this reduces the daily cost of ICU care and the total length of stay. So this is an area of, of really important research. Of course, safety is, is an important concern. And I know many of you are working together on that, on that project. Here's the question though of what happens after the ICU. And there are a lot of places a person might go. The first is home, obviously, but the distinctions between different types of discharge care facilities are huge. And I don't know if they're always fully appreciated. So a subacute nursing facility, um, provides very limited rehabilitation, if any. So there's no requirement about a person's ability to participate in rehab. And they often, patients in these facilities will get maybe one to two hours a day of rehabilitation. There's usually no neuropsychologist on site. Um, so these are often necessary for the most severely injured patients who require very complicated medical care. But my strong belief is that anyone who can possibly benefit from rehabilitation should be sent to a, to a rehabilitation facility, inpatient rehab facility. So the next two, the blue and the pink, these are inpatient rehabilitation facilities, but there's a further distinction between those that specialize in traumatic brain injury and those that don't. So at Mount Sinai Hospital, our inpatient rehabilitation facility is staffed by um, rehabilitation brain injury certified nurses, we have daily brain injury medicine board certified physicians. We have all rehab specialties. Our neurosurgeons are able to consult on their patients because we're right here on site. Um, our patients receive between three and seven hours per day of rehabilitation, physical therapy, occupational speech therapy, speech therapy. And we have full-time psychologists and neuropsychologists. So most patients get daily cognitive rehabilitation. So what does the research tell us about where our patients go? About half go home. And I think we often think of discharge to home as a good thing, but the reality is that many are discharged home with no services and they're discharged home because they don't have insurance to pay for another level of care. Um, about eight to 9% go to a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home. And again, there's important, important distinctions between those two. And only 13% go to inpatient rehabilitation facilities. So all of that research that I talked about earlier coming from the model systems of care, including some of the outcomes that looked a little grim and dim um, in terms of decline and, and five-year outcomes, those were the lucky ones, so to speak. Those are the people who made it to inpatient rehab facilities at model systems of care across the country. So it should make us very concerned about the outcomes of people who don't um, receive that level of intervention. Of course, there are a lot of things that affect whether a person goes to an inpatient rehab facility. Some of them are out of our control because of our facilities don't permit us to, in some cases, admit patients without insurance, but the care disparities here are huge. The question though of, is rehabilitation effective is no longer debated. Um, in 2005, and then again in 2015, the Cochrane Review um, Panel, which is sort of like the indisputed leader of systematic reviews, reviews in clinical fields, shows strong evidence of benefit from formal rehabilitation intervention. And specifically that there are strong evidence that more intensive programs are associated with earlier functional gains. So any patient who can possibly get into an, a brain injury specialized inpatient rehab facility should be strongly encouraged to do so. Interestingly, we also see evidence that suggests that, of course, those who get inpatient rehab, comprehensive rehab early on have the greatest functional improvement, but several studies also show that even if that rehab is initiated a year after injury, that they improve, patient, most patients improve significantly on all measures. What happens in inpatient rehab? I'm gonna run through some of this, but we treat all of the things that are common after brain injury, pain control, agitation, we try to minimize sedation. We start early and often with cognitive rehabilitation, balance training, managing spasticity, um, stimulants to improve alertness and um, disorders of consciousness. We monitor sleep and wakefulness. This is huge. 
um, pain management is a critical piece of it. And again, my colleague, uh, Risa Nakase Richardson in Tampa, she's doing research that has shown that two thirds of TBI patients have sleep apnea during inpatient rehab. So we're doing a lot more careful monitoring of sleep and sleep structure during inpatient rehabilitation. Sleep is critical to long-term improvement and recovery. So this is definitely on our radars. We did, um, we pride ourselves as I think you can tell in providing really an excellent care and transitions from inpatient rehabilitation to the community. But, um, you know, and here at Mount Sinai, we're very lucky to have so many outpatient rehabilitation treatment options for people with a brain injury. But a few years ago, we partnered with colleagues at the University of Washington and we did a study, um, it was a focus group study. So this was my first uh, walk into qualitative research. And what we found is that after discharge from inpatient rehabilitation, people felt totally um, on their own. They, they were overwhelmed. They didn't have the information that they needed. They felt like their, acute, their length of stay was, was shorter than they had hoped. They bring home a severely impaired family member. They don't know how to care for the person. They're not aware of all the resources out there to them. Um, so this concerned us greatly. And it motivated us to develop a clinical trial that is now underway. We're two years into the BRIGHT study. This is a multi-center pragmatic trial where we're essentially comparing standard discharge care to enhanced um, transition care, where each patient is assigned one-on-one -on -one to a case manager or a social worker who does individualized follow-up um, and resource facilitation for the patient and the family for six months after injury. Um, we expect this to be effective, but of course we won't know until the trial is over, but this is where we hope we're, the direction is that we're going. Outpatient rehabilitation here at Mount Sinai, thankfully, I can't speak for everywhere, but our health system is really well suited to provide outpatient rehabilitation. Um, this includes assessment guided individual um, interventions for the full range of injury severity from mild concussion to severe TBI. Cognitive rehabilitation is something that our group has really led the field in, I will say. Um, we treat sleep, fatigue, pain control, mood disorders. And as you saw from those slides previously, some of these things remain highly prevalent for years and years after injury. Cognitive functioning, we work closely with our physicians, our brain injury medicine physicians um, to manage things pharmacologically and non-pharmacologically. We're currently running um, a randomized controlled trial of an internet delivered emotion regulation intervention for traumatic brain injury. This was before COVID, but conveniently we were not interrupted during COVID because the entire study takes place over the internet. We designed it this way on purpose because we know that people across the country need access to specialized rehabilitation interventions and can't get them. Um, we focus in this study on emotion regulation because although cognitive impairment is what we often think of first with moderate to severe TBI, neurobehavioral regulation, agitation, anger, irritability, quick to temper, inappropriate outbursts, those are the things that actually destroy families and lives and occupational um, longevity, this is such an important feature of post-traumatic life for many of our patients. And we have here a study that has made it through feasibility phase two and is now at a full RCT. So hopefully this will be something that we're able to offer more widely. Um, based on our previous um, phase two study, we have already um, deployed that intervention um, it's an executive function and an emotional regulation intervention. It's now being used um, in Boston to treat uh, veterans returning from uh, duty who are having difficulty reintegrating into the community. Um, this is one of many, many, many effective rehabilitation interventions. I'm so tired of going to conferences where I hear people say, oh, there are no FDA approved interventions for brain injury. That is true. To some extent, we don't have enough disease modifying interventions, but we pick up the slack at least to some extent on the rehab side. We have literally written the manual on cognitive rehabilitation. Um, we're one of the, our group is one of the founding authors where we've taken all of the evidence-based literature on 
empirically supported cognitive rehabilitation interventions, and we've broken it down into a step-by-step -step manual. So clinicians across the country and literally world, we've trained over, we've trained, I think now 2,000 individuals across the world in these effective approaches. The last thing I'll talk about is mild traumatic brain injury. So these results come from colleagues, um, Lynn Nelson at the TRAC TBI study where they enroll patients at the time of emergency room care. Anyone who is deemed to require a CT scan is enrolled in the study, regardless of whether there are findings on the scan or not. That is the inclusion criteria. So we're talking about mild TBI that's not unconcerning because they required a CT scan, but this is mild, complicated, mild TBI. What you see here is that the vast majority are sent home. Um, and this clearly demonstrates the, the data that I'm showing here that people with a complicated mild TBI are at much higher risk for prolonged recovery um, relative to simple, uncomplicated, not requiring CT scan concussion. Um, and we see that even compared to um, orthopedic control groups where someone sustained a serious orthopedic injury, outcomes a year later are still not nearly where they should be if we wanna define recovery based on pre-injury change. This is a borrowed slide, but I think the sentiment is, is really important here. The idea is that non-hospitalized patients with mild TBI are the forgotten minority. Um, they often show incomplete recovery, even on very gross functional outcome measures like the Glasgow Outcome Scale Extended. And I'm bringing this up because here at Mount Sinai, we have the ability to improve upon that. So patients who are seen in our emergency department, who are monitored briefly and then sent home, we have clinical services available to them. And I think that we have a lot of opportunities to intervene across the years not just days, weeks, months after a traumatic brain injury to improve outcomes, to help ensure that the majority of our patients are in the category who do live effective, meaningful, enjoyable lives after a brain injury. Last thing I'll say is that I think that this need for collaboration between neurosurgeons and trauma surgeons and rehabilitation professionals has now been widely recognized um, as one of the leaders of the Brain Injury Interdisciplinary Special Interest Group of the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, we have forged a very successful relationship with the American College of Surgeons and the Committee on Trauma with the goal of working together to kind of close that gap between discharge from acute from, from intensive care, from trauma care, and where rehabilitation picks up. I think that this is a goal that is also shared by us in the New York Neurotrauma Consortium. Um, Zach mentioned this in the beginning, but this is an interdisciplinary group of um, clinicians and researchers who are interested in neurotrauma more broadly. We have a goal of bringing people together from multiple disciplines to improve care and to improve education around neurotrauma. That is my last slide, and that is how you can contact us. The middle information is our Brain Injury Research Center. We love to collaborate, and the number at the bottom is our rehabilitation neuropsychology faculty practice. Um, my assistant there, Susan, is amazing and she will help clear insurances, triage to the rehab professionals that can best help a given patient. So we hope that you will um, reach out on the clinical side and also for research collaborations. Great, thank you, Kristen. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties this morning. I think some people uh, still had the old link, um, but we'll make sure going forward that that doesn't happen as well. Um, if you're okay with it, we typically put uh, these recordings in our share folder and send it out to everybody that's on our distribution list so they can access the um, conference later. And um, we're gonna work with Alyssa to make sure that these are all going up on our uh, YouTube channel as well, and on Sinai Neurosurgery YouTube channel. Um, as well. I'm not sure if you guys have one from the Brain Injury Research Center, a YouTube channel. We are yeah. not that fancy. Maybe we need to get up with the time. <laughs> um, but you brought up a lot of good points. I want to see if anybody has any questions. Um, if you do, just raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, I'll make it so you can speak. Um, 
you know, I think one of the things that you highlight very well is that, you know, pretty much by and large, everyone does better with rehab. You know, it's like similar to like patients that come into our clinic with, with spine problems. They all do better with physical therapy. There's not <laughs> really anybody that, you know, we shouldn't be sending it to it, but obviously the big, you know, some one of the things we see at Elmhurst in particular, obviously, and other kind of safety net hospitals is there just isn't, uh, you know, there isn't really the, re you know, there isn't the same access to care or resources that um, people might get elsewhere. So, you know, often, oftentimes, you know, trauma centers in other states may be at places like, you, you know, UPMC and stuff like that, or even in Miami where it is a safety net hospital, but it's the, it's affiliate, it's the main trauma center as well. And it's really closely affiliated with the University of Miami. There's a, you know, they do have access, but I feel like, uh, you know, it's one of those things where uh, if, if uh, you know, where there really needs to be kind of almost like, you know, either government involvement to ensure that anybody would be insured, that, that has a TBI would be insured to get rehab or, yeah. you know, in, for instance, in Florida, it's a state law that everybody has to have a neuropsychological evaluation before they can get discharged. Now That's that amazing. kind of delays some discharges, but it means that everybody has that gets that regardless of whether they can pay for it or not. I mean, so. we're, we're too far away from that. I mean, the part that the part that I feel like I have a little more control over is our our faculty practice um, where we are on every insurance panel pretty much that exists. And we do that at a major cost loss, I'm sure. But mm -hmm. we do that because we need everyone to be able to access empirically supported neuro rehabilitation. Um, we have a sliding fee scale, like we do whatever we can to work with people, but the inpatient rehab thing that you point out is a huge barrier. And I hope something that our health system will be, will also prioritize with us. Yeah, my, my feeling is too, yeah, yeah, it does cost a lot of upfront, I'm sure. But I wonder, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some people have looked at this, but like in terms of like the improvements that people make and the chances of returning to a you know, quote unquote, productive life, you the know, I'm sure that, that I'm sure I'm sure the cost is actually it's actually probably almost cost beneficial. I would think absolutely that if everybody was to get this, you know. Yeah, we've done some of this work. When you compare someone who's discharged to um, a nursing home, for example, to someone who's discharged to an inpatient rehabilitation facility, of course, matched on all the relevant characteristics, the the long term lifeline life lifeline costs are tremendously reduced. You get someone up and walking and out and more independent before they're discharged home. Of course that, I mean, that that's like yeah. a, an investment in a person's life. Yeah. And of course that's just, you know, dealing very coldly just with the costs and let alone like the, you know, well, the cost of the, the patients and the family. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, Neha uh, has a question as well. Um, I think you, you're unmuted, Neha, are you? Or do you? Okay. Oops, sorry. Go ahead. You're still muted. Sorry. Here. Oh, wait, wait. I think you're still muted, Neha. Is that better? There yeah, you go. Sorry. Awesome. Uh, Kristen, that was absolutely fantastic. There were so many things that you mentioned, which are super, super important. And I don't know how many people who are in the acute care realm realize a lot of these things. So any thoughts on how to improve some of this access to care and bridge these gaps and then longitudinally after patients are discharged from acute rehab facilities for ongoing rehab, particularly for the vulnerable populations? I don't even, I don't even think they know that they can uh, avail of services longitudinally. So how, mm -hmm. how do we fix this? I mean, my hope is that we start today. Like when, when I hear you say that, and, and you've helped open my eyes to this too, Neha, is that, um, that sometimes the clinicians across the care continuum don't know about what one another do and what we, ha what we have um, available even here within our own health system. So I think like educating each other is, is part of it. And I've learned so much from you too about um, how care decisions are made and how transitions happen. Um, I think that, you know, we recognize that traumatic brain injury um, disproportionately affects people from underserved communities. And we know that the outcomes of minorities with brain injury tend to be worse. And there's no doubt that that, has, that, that reflects disparities in care. Um, we have not been successful in overcoming the hurdle to admission to inpatient rehab for people who don't have insurance. 
but we do have a TBI clinic where brain injury medicine physicians provide long-term care for people with brain injury. We have the outpatient hospital uh, rehabilitation neuropsychology practice. We have the faculty practice. And unlike many faculty practices, we take almost every insurance. So we have tried to make these services available to people, but I think that that the, the next step is to, is to, I guess, let others know that we exist. I think that we, I mean, I sometimes bump into a neurologist and they're like, do you know anywhere that does rehab or cognitive rehab? And they're so surprised to know that, it, that it's offered here in our system. So maybe we need better marketing or something. Zach, we need a YouTube channel, I think. Um, but we need to, the, the, we need to identify those gaps in care and, and fill them. So people who are discharged home, even after a, a relatively unconcerning trauma to the head, they can be referred to our practice and we'll decide with the patient if they require maybe just a brief cognitive evaluation, maybe a few sessions to manage um, sleep disturbance and fatigue and some of those early sequelae of a concussion. Um, those are usually sh very short-term patients. We see them for a month, maybe a few sessions, and then their recovery is, is going nicely and they don't need us anymore. Um, patients with more severe injuries, we sometimes keep patients on our treatment um, caseload for a year or longer. We often kind of, for some patients who don't need us as often, we'll check in quarterly or something, but, but many people who survive an injury have lifelong changes. And so they need lifelong care. And we're not going to do it alone or ourselves, but this is starting the conversation, I think is just so important. Oh, agreed. And you, you guys, um, I know what it was about a year or two now, you kind of formally started that outpatient uh, mild TBI um, rehabilitation program. I, guess. I mean, I guess, no, it was going on before that, but I think there was a more kind of... Uh, right. So Eric, Dr. Eric Watson heads that up. And that's what I was referring to when I said, you know, it's a brief cognitive rehabilitation, a brief um, cognitive evaluation and really tailored interventions. I mean, for some people, post-concussion symptoms are predominantly about anxiety that can manifest as a cognitive change, but the real treatable target is the anxiety. The same is sometimes true for sleep, which is often disturbed. Um, sometimes it's, it's balance or vestibular changes. So it differs for each person. So we do that quick evaluation, identify the most important treatment targets, and then deploy treatment that's really short term. I mean, most of those patients are um, are no longer on our caseload after about a month. What's what's the best way for people to contact you guys if they want to? If it's somebody that doesn't need inpatient TBI rehab, it really might need uh, uh, outpatient TBI rehab from you know an excellent team such as such as you guys um the number right there so susan susan okay. georgie is my administrative assistant and she serves to triage referrals throughout our outpatient um rehab program so um what's her name again susan georgie it's g-i-o-r-g-i -G -I, but that is her yeah. direct line and she checks it every single day even when she's remote so um we we just hired another clinician, so we're ready to we're ready to help if there are patients who need us. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions? There's uh, something else in the chat here. Let me just see. There's just one of my PA saying an absolutely excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me to this. Yeah, thank you for speaking. Um, we'll be I'll be sure to put this up on our and send out the link to this as well. And I'll get Alyssa to put it up on our YouTube as well. Awesome. Very Thank you. Good. Um, okay. All right, everybody. Uh, sorry again for the technical difficulties, but we'll make sure that doesn't happen in the future. And thanks everybody for attending. All right, good to all see right. you. All right, all right.